Let's celebrate these young students from McKinley Middle for that historic performance, capturing one of the main events, I would say, in the history of African Americans, and that is the Underground Railroad that Harriet Tubman left or led. It is so good to see so many of you all out this evening and thank you for coming out thank you for being here this evening we want to uh, thank all of our guests our elected officials we've got pastors we've got faith leaders we've got students we've got the steering committee we have the fabric of baton rouge represented tonight in this auditorium but now it gives me great pleasure to introduce dr lee smith the Chancellor of Baton Rouge Community College, who has been so kind to host us here this evening, Chancellor Smith. Thank you, Mayor. I bring you greetings from Baton Rouge Community College. Uh, I'd like to also recognize many of my Vice President Cabinet members who may be in the audience tonight Dr. Phil, uh, VC Smith, Phil Smith, VC Corlin LeBlanc, CIO Ron Solomon, VC Dr. Sarah Barlow, and Vice Chancellor Dr. Pamela Jones. If you're in the audience, you please stand. I'd like to recognize these individual, individuals who support our leadership team at the college, so thank you. 
It, it is indeed an honor and privilege to be here tonight, and certainly for BRCC and our PBI grant to serve as the host of this event. This event is supposed to occur during Black History Month, but how dare you, you give me a month to talk about black history. Every month is Black History Month. The relevance of Black History Month and the work that Dr. Martin Luther King and so many of us have done is going to be celebrated throughout our journey, certainly tonight with our guest speaker. But we all play a role in our history and what we do for our, leave our legacy behind or the things that we gave back to this country. A little bit about Baton Rouge Community College. We are the second largest community college in the state, the second largest higher education institution in the capital region, serving over 8,000 students. Uh, we are what we call a comprehensive community college, where we prepare students to go to work or those who want to transfer to our four-year university. We are committed here at BRCC to be engaged not only in civics and arts and display, but also our community. Uh, as part of our name is Baton Rouge Community College, and I stress every day that we matter in this community, and we want to be impactful, and we certainly want to support our community, and so we're excited for you joining us tonight. The topic of voter suppression is dangerous and unconstitutional, yet some have managed to be creative in developing laws and policies to influence the outcome of an election by discouraging or preventing specific groups of people from voting. But we won't let that happen, right? Primarily, the groups targeted and impacted by voter suppression has been black, brown, and low-income Americans through gerrymandering and identification, excuse me, identification requirements. This is a very important issue today, and we all must be in the fight against this practice. So thank you for allowing me to be here, and certainly for you guys uh, coming out tonight to join us on this occasion, and look forward to our guest speaker, and thank you, Mayor Broom, again. Thank you, Chancellor Smith. Now, many of you may realize that we had planned to host uh, this event last month as part of our Walking in Legacy series to honor the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and to celebrate Black History Month. Uh, we had to postpone this particular event because our keynote speaker, Reverend Moss, uh, wasn't able to get a flight out of Chicago where he lives due to inclement weather. Uh, but you know what? I am always convinced that God's timing is perfect. And I believe tonight is the perfect time for us to hear from Reverend Moss. And you know what? I think we should have conversations around black history, not only in February, but throughout the year. Does anybody else believe that? <laughs> Tonight's event is focused on the subject of voting rights, but it's also about the power of family in overcoming challenges like these. Michelle Obama once said, history has shown us that courage can be contagious and hope can take on a life of its own. I believe that family shows us how to be courageous and hopeful when we face challenges. Tonight's event includes a screening of Otis's Dream, which you'll hear more about from Reverend Moss. Reverend Moss is the senior pastor of Trinity United Church of Christ in Chicago, Illinois. Dr. Otis Moss III is a preacher, he's an activist, and an author. And over the last two decades, Dr. Moss has practiced and preached a black theology that unapologetically calls attention to the problems of mass incarceration, environmental justice, and economic inequality. Dr. Moss is committed to preaching a prophetic message of love and justice, which he believes are inseparable companions that form the foundation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. A native of Cleveland, Ohio, Dr. Moss is an honors graduate of Morehouse College and earned a Master of Divinity from Yale Divinity School and a Doctorate of Ministry from the Chicago Theological Seminary. 
He returned to Yale in 2014 to present the Fame Lyman Beecher Lectures, which were the foundation of his 2015 book, Blue Note Preaching in a Post-Soul World, Finding Hope in an Age of Despair. Dr. Moss is highly influenced by the works of Zora Neale Hurston, August Wilson, Howard Thurman, jazz, and hip-hop music. The work and legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and the pastoral ministry of his father, Dr. Otis Moss Jr. of Cleveland, Ohio, have also been primary mentors for his spiritual formation. Would you please welcome Dr. Otis Moss III. I want to take this opportunity to thank Mayor Broom for this invitation uh, to be here in Baton Rouge and to our Chancellor, uh, Chancellor Smith, for the work that you are doing and the marvelous, marvelous job that the students did in their presentation, Blessing Us in Dance. I uh, thank you, uh, the students who are here in the community, uh, at, for this conversation around voter suppression and voting rights and to share this film uh, that we put together entitled Otis's Dream that is about my grandfather's attempt to vote in 1946 in what is known as Troop County, Georgia, uh, the western portion of Georgia, very close to the Alabama border. I want to share something, uh, just a few remarks before we go uh, to the film. Uh, I grew up in, in Cleveland, Ohio. And growing up in Cleveland, Ohio, I had a godfather uh, by the name of Alfred Warren. We did not call Alfred or Mr. Warren. We called him Torpedo uh, because he was an all-American diver at the Central State University. And every year, he would take myself along with uh, my god brother, uh, Carlin Warren. We would go to something known as the circus. I'm not talking about just any circus. I'm talking about the Barnum and Bailey Three Ring Circus. Loved everything about that circus. I loved uh, the fact that you could go to the circus and you could see a little car that would drive by and it was so small, but yet 11 clowns would jump out of the car. I loved the trapeze artists. I loved everything. I loved the animals, the lions, the tigers, the bears. Oh my, I loved everything about the circus. But in particular, I, I was completely, utterly fascinated by some animals known as elephants. And what didn't make any sense to me is why these elephants, who were powerful and majestic, strong and so large and awesome, why they would listen to a little man with a whip and a chair. It made absolutely no sense to me. And I was always worried every time we went to the circus, because we had good seats, I was afraid that there was an elephant coup d'etat that was going to take place on the third row. Uh, but uh, I had to ask my, my godfather, why is it, Mayor Broom, that these elephants who have more power, who have more authority, and have more strength than this man with the whip in the chair, why would they listen to someone that does not have as much strength and power as they do? And it was my godfather who said something that, that made so much sense, it connects specifically to this idea of voter suppression. He said, Otis, I want you to know uh, that uh, these elephants, when they are small, uh, they were chained and they had chains around their necks and roughly a chain about 12 feet in length. Uh, that would be a limit on their mobility. They would develop with these chains around their necks and this chain that was roughly about 12 feet in length. Uh, that was a limit among their, mo their mobility. And when they got a certain age, they were eventually emancipated from their chains. But because they had been living in chains so long, they assumed that there was a limit upon their mobility. Because they had a chain not just around their neck, but they had a chain around their mind. And so they were trained to believe that someone who did not have as much power as they do actually had authority over them. But it was my godfather who said something, Mayor Broom, that, that blessed me. He said, now the most dangerous type of animal, an elephant in particular, 
is an elephant that recognizes I have nothing to lose. When I know that your, tra that your whip can't hurt me, nor can your, uh, your chair stop me, then there is a revolution that is on the way. And we are in a moment in American history where though there are those who want to keep particular chains of miseducation around our minds and around our spirit. And I say this, we must be mighty powerful that you have to institute so many laws just to keep somebody from voting. We must be mighty powerful that 27 states across uh, this union uh, has to pass laws to prevent people from voting because there is great fear uh, that there will be a voter revolution and we will recognize the power that we truly have. It was in America in 1890, it was known as the Mississippi Plan, uh, that a group of people who were fearful of what happened during the Reconstruction period, they wanted to pull back all of the gains that were made ever since emancipation. From 1865 to roughly 1910, we did, people of African descent did what no immigrant group in this country has ever done. Within less than 20 years, we were able to amass over a million acres of land, along with, along with banks and other financial institutions. And by 19, not 1910, we had over 93 historically black colleges that were created across these United States. People that they were not allowed to read nor vote, but in less than 30 years, they were able to create institutions that no other group in this nation was able to do in such a short amount of time. And in 1890, a group in Mississippi said, we got to stop this. We have to put some chains back on to ensure that this revolution does not continue on. Please understand uh, that voting rights is just one area of the transformation of this country. That if we are to build a nation for our children who have not yet been born, we must make sure that everyone has the right to vote and access to the ballot. It was a person by the name of Robert Smalls in South Carolina who was born uh, an enslaved African, that when he eventually moved back to the state after he had set himself free, he moved back to the state and even bought the house where he was a slave in. Matter of fact, even allowed the mistress to live in that house, not in the big house, in the house out back. And he became a representative in South Carolina, considered to be the wealthiest man in South Carolina, became representative, made his way to Congress and did something that many people do not even know. The fact that we go to the public school today, the fact that we have what we know as pre-K and kindergarten is because of the legislation of Robert Smalls, a former enslaved African who said, when I have the right to vote, it is not just about my community. It is also ensuring that everyone experiences the possibility of being fully human. Allowing one group to have the right to vote does not diminish anyone, but expands the democracy, in the words of W.E.B. Du Bois, of these yet to be United States of America. And this film that we created is a film that tells the story Story, yes, of my grandfather, but it is everyone's story here. A story of denial, but also a story of triumph. The story of a sharecropper and a World War I veteran. A story of a man who was so in love with his wife, Magnolia Moss, but she died as a result of medical apartheid. And he refused to get remarried. He decided in the 1930s to raise five children on his own because he loved his wife. Now, those who are elders in this space understand that in the 1930s, if someone passed on, a man would just go ahead and get married again because he needed someone to take care of the children. He decided, I'm going to be the dad and the mom in this house. Even though I am a sharecropper, I will raise these children because I cannot get married to anyone else because I love my magnolia. This is the story that you are about to see. I leave you with this. A simple story from Howard Thurman, one of the great uh, ministers, minito, min, min, ministers and also mentor of Dr. King. He tells a story of when he was small in Daytona uh, Beach, Florida, 
that he saw an elder who was planting pecan or pecan trees, depending upon what part of the country you're from, how you pronounce it. And he, he saw this elder. He must have been about 10 or 12 at the time when he saw this elder planting. And this person was about 80 years of age. And he said, sir, I see that you're planting these pecan trees, but, but, but you're not going to live long enough to see them grow nor eat the fruit from the tree. And the elder leaned back and looked at young Howard Thurman and said, all my life, I've been eating from trees I did not plant. The least I can do is plant for somebody else. And that is the role and responsibility that we have to plant for someone else. So we share with you the story of a sharecropper who attempted to vote in 1946, Otis Moss Sr. The film is entitled Otis's Dream. Thank you. Let me tell you a story, a story about my father, Otis Moss Sr. 